initially looking for summarized oh, intelligence report. How's it launching so back out? When I walked in the building, I could hear them. Uh, buzzing. Yeah. I, I thought it was wasps. Yeah. That's dirt dog or that's something. And I started looking around. Funny be here. And there's one there. And I could hear. But so for folks that are attending online, we're going to give the meeting about two more minutes. We have some people that have not reported yet, and we have a little bit of traffic here in Moorhead City. So give it about two more minutes. Okay, folks, we are going to go ahead and start the meeting now. Uh, it's now 6.05 and we will be doing our um, roll call first, call to order. Okay, we're going to vote on our agenda first and we'll start with are we going to do this as individual or are we going to do this as a motion to approve the okay. agenda? Um, motion to approve the agenda. Second motion. Excellent. Approved and seconded. Second. And then just in discussion, then you can vote. Okay. Sorry, guys. And and discussion, and we are going to move on to. Anybody's opposed? Oh, is anybody opposed? Oops. Right. Just move by consensus, Dave. We uh, move by consensus. Pass <laughs> <laughs> You just need a, a motion on your approval of your minutes from January 12th. Okay. We need a motion to approve the minutes from our January 12th meeting. So moved. So moved. Get, get a name. Got Bill Tarpley. <laughs> Need a second. Second. Lewis Dunn, right? right. Yeah. Great. And so, any discussion or um, changes to the? Do we have any discussion or any changes to the meeting notes? None. Any opposition? Any opposition? Moving on. We are going to move to um, our commission update with Lara. Laura. Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, I'm going to give the commission update, and then I did speak with Sarah before, and I'm also going to, after I give the commission update, I'll pause, and then we'll roll into the July joint meeting discussion right after that. So um, 
All right, so the Marine Fisheries Commission um, February meeting was held in New Bern, and I am going to give sort of the brief overview of that meeting, um, but I also want to remind everyone that the meetings um, are all recorded and available online. Um, our PIO, that's our that stands for now on the spot, but um, they check and work all of those YouTube videos. So if there's any issue that you are interested in going back and listen to, uh, listening to detail, you can go onto the um, website and listen to those. They're very easy to navigate. Um, I do want to warn you that if you start to listen to those on YouTube, it doesn't impact your algorithm. So <laughs> you will have to get speak you meetings from the <laughs> But they're great. You should look at them. So, um, with false albacore, uh, I'm going to start off with that one. So, in February, the commission um, the commission reviewed a false albacore information paper that the division um, had prepared at their request. So, this was an update to a 2017 paper that was a general review of information about the false albacore fishery in North Carolina. Um, following quite a bit of discussion on that information paper, the commission ultimately did pass a motion asking um, staff to develop rulemaking language uh, with management options for false albacore, starting with a status quo um, fishery and then allowing for growth in the fishery at various percentage points. So staff are reviewing um, available data to define some of those terms. Um, for example, what is status quo at this time? Um, and the division is going to be presenting its initial analysis at the commission meeting in May. So the final issue paper, which would include, include the um, rule language options, um, is anticipated uh, at either the uh, August or the November commission meeting for um, their decision on that. Um, I do want to note, we had a question at the Northern Commission meeting, excuse me, the Northern Advisory uh, meeting that um, the South Atlantic uh, Council did review false albacore management and they decided not to take um, management action at this time, but they are going to review landings, I believe, um, on a three-year cycle. Actually, yep. Who asked that question? Huh? Who, Who asked, asked that question? That? Was it Charlie Locke? Uh, no, I think it was Tom Thomas Newman. Uh, uh, yeah, well, uh, here's my second question. Thomas actually answered it, I think. Um, no, he did answer it. He answered it because he said, I'm on the South the advisory panel. Committee, I think. Uh, I don't remember who asked it. I'd have to go back. It's on a video which I was <laughs> online for you. Uh, but yeah, I don't remember who asked the question. But I just wanted to bring it up because it has been discussed. Um, at the South Atlantic, it's also being discussed at the Atlantic States uh, interstate uh, management. So they have not made a final decision at Atlantic States, so um, it's still sort of up in the air. But our commission will be looking at North Carolina specific management options. I, I think I, I'm going to add here just because I was a part of all of that. It was the council discussion mm -hmm. said that the state should look at it. And uh, the chairman or the executive director of the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission said, no, they don't want to do it. So that's what he said. Now, the commission may do otherwise. So that's one reason why I opted to look at it at the states, because the feds and interstate don't want to do it. Um, so the next item is spotted sea trout. Um, and in February, the staff leads presented an overview of the spotted sea trout fishery and received input from commissioners on items for consideration in FMP development. Um, so I'm not going to go too much into this. Um, and if I know they're, I'm expecting to have a healthy conversation on this topic from the FinFish Committee. Um, but we have that as a specific, a specific item on your agenda. So um, I do want to touch on uh, this here, but not go too far into the questions at this time. So um, uh, I do want to talk about the scoping period. So scoping periods were implemented um, as a way to address public concern that we heard uh, about not being able to provide input early enough in an FMP process. So scoping is done before any FMP is drafted. So at this time, um, the public, we basically take out a scoping document, which gives the public an idea of what we're thinking about before we go into developing 
district management plan. We get that feedback from the public and then we take that and the division's plan development team uses that and then they begin to develop the actual um, So we did have um, feedback from the commission. Um, Commissioner Cross's um, feedback has gotten around and has been uh, the focus of a lot of public comment. Um, it was more complete than we typically get at this time. So, um, if you have questions about that, we can ask, we can talk about it more um, at that later time. But um, I did want to acknowledge that we have gotten a lot of public feedback. Um, but this is the time to get that input. This is the beginning. So, that's what the scoping period is for is to get public input. And um, as I think Lucas will, will talk about when he talks about the scoping period, we have gotten um, more feedback about spotted sea trout. Spotted sea trout than we have about a lot of other. So that's good. <laughs> um, all right, so let's see. I went through that one. Okay, so strike mullet. Uh, so back in November of last year, um, the commission had selected a preferred management option for the strike mullet supplement A. Um, and that was for a statewide November 7th through December 31st season, season closure, um, which was estimated to result in a 22.1% reduction in that fishery. Um, that was just a statewide. Um, in February, the commission uh, heard the outcome of the public comment period. Um, and based on that comment that they received, um, they did request that the division consider developing uh, regionally specific seasons. There was a lot of concern about it because the fisheries are different in the different regions, um, that there be some consideration of that in the supplement management. So um, staff are currently working on that, and um, the um, supplement will come back to the commission in May for continued discussion. Um, and just as a reminder, uh, a supplement is meant to address overfishing immediately while more comprehensive management is developed in an amendment. So um, we're working on this supplement A management. It's expected to be management for the 2023 season. We are also drafting and preparing amendment two for strike mullet, which would have more comprehensive management. That's expected to be completed by the 2024 season. So supplement A really is focused on the 2023 season and um, implementing management immediately to stop the provision. Um, all right, so finally, I wanna wrap up with the Coastal Habitat Protection Plan. Um, relating to the CHIP, um, the commission unanimously approved a motion supporting the Coastal Habitat Initiative Resolution which came from the Stakeholder Engagement and Coastal Habitats Initiative. Um, that's the SECI. They, uh, I, I bet that they came up with that um, before they came up with the name. <laughs> Very clever. A SECI is something that you use to test water quality. If you have never heard that, it's called a SECI disc. Um, so this resolution was focused on encouraging the state to increase funding for voluntary cost share programs and to help improve water quality. Um, so, as a reminder, DMF and APNEP worked collectively with a core team of NGOs to form a public-private partnership, um, which is uh, the Stakeholder Engagement and Coastal Habitat Initiative, so that's the SECI, which was a recommendation from the 2021 CHIP Amendment. And the resolution was also supported by the Coastal Resource Commission and the um, EMC. And their recent meetings, um, they approved those at their uh, at their recent meetings, which was after the commission approved it. Um, the May commission meeting is scheduled for May 24th through the 26th at the Beaufort Hotel in Beaufort. And um, I've talked about striped mullet, spotted sea trout, false albacore, which are all on the May agenda. Um, but uh, I, if you wanna see a more comprehensive overview of all the things that are gonna be on that agenda, um, I just wanna refer you to the MFC work plan those are developed um, for each meeting, each MFC meeting. So those are in the briefing materials. So the most current one is in the February MFC briefing materials. 
And that has out like three or four years, sort of what the schedule for each meeting looks like roughly. Um, and that's all I have. So I'll pause there if anyone has questions. <laughs> yeah. I have one I hope you don't answer, but <laughs> at the commission meeting about the strike mother. Yes. Um, I spoke to Dan and the other team. Jeff. Jeff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and being that this past year was the fifth largest recorded landing in North Carolina history on Stripe Mullet, they were going back and looking at that, but I didn't know that the commission now was even going to take any of that in consideration. They couldn't get their data together quick enough, but the fifth largest year and only like 5% lower than the number one year in the all North Carolina recorded history. It seemed kind of, kind of the wrong application for something that for a fishery to have that kind of landings to supplements are made for emergency management taxes and you have a management plan that's right right in line right now coming into pipe coming down the pipe why you would take a supplement action on something where it doesn't with that amount of land is it, it doesn't show that it, it, there should be that kind of need for a supplement yeah so um so i don't know so first question i don't know if they have finished Looking at the year, I guess 2022 data is still in process. It's correct, or is it? It's, it's preliminary, but it's available. Um, and it was a high year. You you know that very well. Um, the effort was high too. Yeah. So I mean, it doesn't landings don't necessarily correlate to fish mortality. Um, so I don't know that. I mean, we're not going to update the assessment between now and. Right. End and of the year. But what I was going to say is, the, uh, we don't base right the management off of the landing based off. Right. Of right. I understand it typically based off of stock, but but the supplements were were put in place right. for emergency management actions where you really saw severe stock detriment and with a season with that much harvest, it looks like to me that you would kind of look at the right on the wall to say that might be a little bit severe. Take that kind of management on the fishery. When you already have it in line for, for framework and for a review of F and P. Well, I mean that's where I was going. I mean it's a it's a risk assessment. Like how much risk you want to take? The director felt that the stock assessment and the the the, the prior decade of of you know the overfished overfishing status of striped mullet warranted some action to go ahead and start that rebuild period. I will tell you, like from the projections and stuff, that um, striped mullet are are fairly resilient fish. Like uh, if you protect a couple of good year classes, you get a pretty quick rebound. Um, so having a good year class like that, if if you did protect that, it cycles through pretty quickly um, with the rebuilding part of that. But the supplement itself is to address overfishing specifically. Um, but it's impossible to know without doing a new stock assessment and delaying things a couple more years, you know, how that year class plays into the specifics um, for the stock. So. The stock system we have is will be the one that they base management off of for the time being, at least. Wait, and why wasn't there a continuity analysis done between the two stock assessments? The continuity between the two stock assessments? Yes, the, the, the one previously to the one that was used. Mm -hmm. And the one previous to that, there was major differences. And that was brought up at the first scoping meeting. This is going back to Stripe Mullet. And I was wondering why. DMF did not do a continuity analysis, why there was such great differences between the, either the data input or the models that were used. Yeah, I, for me to answer that question right now, I probably am not the best qualified person. I know Dan and Jeff have both put together some information for you specifically related to the differences between the assessments and, and the treatment of the data. I, I can just tell you that through the, the peer review process that we went through, um, you know, the reviewers were very comfortable with the changes and the differences in the model and um, felt that the model we came to, you know, there were some slight changes in the model during the, the peer review process um, based on the peer review input from the experts, which aren't DMF employees. These are an independent panel of people that come in, look at our data, um, look at the, you know, it, did we use the data appropriately? Did we use the model appropriately and that sort of thing? Um, and they felt very comfortable into that, that we had a very stable model that was giving us very useful information. So um, 
I defer you back to um, Jeff and Dan. They they were the experts on that and have the history. I'm just probably not qualified to really details in this environment right here right now. So. I, I remember we had that discussion when we had the assessment presented to us, and there was um, I recall I don't, there was a life history parameter that mm. was, there was a fairly significant change. I don't remember if it was natural mortality they, or age of maturity. They updated maturity schedule, yeah. and that was based on a more current study. Um, I think that was very very briefly mentioned in the stock assessment, but I didn't see any really analysis of any what what I would consider a continuity analysis that. Say the feds do, mm -hmm. and that's all I, you know, I'm just bringing it up. I'm, right. you know, just asking if that, if that's something that will be considered in the future when you have differences between the stock between two different stock assessments from the old, new. Right. There's major differences. <clears throat> yeah, I'm, all I'm saying is, and there, I mean, I've had peer reviewers ask for continuity runs before if they felt like it was needed or necessary, and that has been done. I've, I've seen where, you know, we had an assessment result, said go back and do the continuity run and let's look at let us look at that. But in this case, you know, that's that's what they felt comfortable with and what they passed for management. So did you have a question, Brent? Yeah. Also on the size of the fish and the amount of, of male fish early on in some of that larger harvest season. Um, some of the fish that the division took from just my facility alone, but not just mine. Other ones also the male fish were being four to five and six pounds. Uh, so in this last year, you mean it's unusually they, large males? Kind of goes back to the same thing. <laughs> you don't necessarily look at landings, but you also look at this at the the year classes of the fish. Absolutely. And with that that kind of year class built right on through the entire stock, just don't pursue the failure in the stock. You know, looking at it. And, and I just I know they were going back to try and get some of that data because it kind of came to them at the last minute when they were getting their stuff together to present to the commission, you know, to samples like David and Mark and different ones mm -hmm. that were that were starting to get that stuff and they were they were uh, your class on. I was trying to find the graphic. Um, one thing we talk about a lot with the striped mullet, because uh, we see that big gear class, there have been good landings. We've seen it in our sampling. There's a lot of mullet around. Uh, and so that's good. We want that to happen. But what we also see with the stock assessment is years of decline. And that's what we're trying to, that's what we're trying to address. It's not, it's not, this is a good year, this is a bad year. It's for 20 years, what does it look like? And as those stock assessment models, you know, as we move forward with those, like with all science, the more we know, the better they get. So the last one is not as good as this one is. And they're going to continue to change and get better, hopefully. But um, it does, especially when it feels like they're going from, everything's okay to now it's getting worse and it's just the model got worse or something like that it you know i, I can see how it might feel like that so well I think that from my perspective if if you're harvesting fish and they're all say pound fish pound and a half fish and, and you you don't see any big fish in the stock then there's a good chance that the stock's not expanding and you don't have it, that variation of age structure through it but when you see the different sizes of those fish and a consistency, not just one week for the entire period of harvest, uh, it, it just leads you to believe that the stock is in probably a little bit better shape than it may be the perception of the stock assessment. Uh, and when you think about this being the fifth largest year that North Carolina has ever had landing, there's probably fewer commercial fishermen than has ever been in the history of North Carolina. And you think back about when those large landings were, when they were paying the two two dollars a pound for row mullets to the fishermen when that fishery first occurred, or more, yeah. and those guys could fish at that point in time. That's been twenty years ago. Is what it cost them to fish then versus what it cost them to fish today, and what they got for their fish then versus what they got from today. They could fish then for fifty pounds or hundred pounds a day, where they can't do that now. 
So, so you actually had more effort then than you had now. But you had a very similar amount of landings. If you'd had the same amount of fishermen, you would have floated out of the water. It'd been the biggest year you ever had. And your your year class of your fish, based upon what was coming through these facilities, support that in size. It's not that they're just first year class or second year class fish. At all your classes are there. And you've got the data through sampling to support that. That's where you choose to use it or not. Well, I mean that age data will be available. I've Talking with Dan, I, I think he's still saying, and I, I don't know about this last particular year. I haven't talked to him specifically about last year, but it's still predominantly H two fish that are are dominating the catch. And there's there is some historical truncation of the age structure that we've seen. Um, so, but we can certainly go back and look closer at that just to verify what you're saying. You know, I just say to take a a drastic measure management measure like yeah. supplement. You would think that you would have a lot more dire need when you look at the fishery than, than what it appears right. that this fishery has presently. I'd say there'd be a lot more fisheries that would have more dire need to be looked at than, than that yeah. at the present status. Of and it's, I would just be mindful, like it's really hard to, it's really hard to gauge like a, a good year of harvest based off of a what would be predominantly a, a strong year class of fish um, because the capacity in the fishery is such you don't know if F went up or down just because you had more landings. It's 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 really hard to know. Our our index also went up quite a bit. Um, it was probably one of the higher indices we have. That was at the same time we saw that spike in the year class. And at the same time that you didn't have a fish landed on that beach to both banks, all the fish that's been landed over history, not one landed on that beach by your by your setting that stopping that crew. Mm -hmm. But yet those fish went south earlier. Eight to ten miles off the beach, going right on board, prime pan show. I believe what survey had the what fishery independent survey yeah. increased. The the gillnet survey is the primary index that the um I think the and that's the difference Alan was talking about like the previously they'd use like what we call program one forty six, which was the electro shocking mm -hmm. survey, and the, the reviewers actually had some issues with that because it was so regionally specific and um but it actually the 915 which is our gillnet survey um tracked really well with the population and they, they thought that was the best representation both geographically and as an index itself tracking fish and 146 is just on in inland waters where there's no it's in the and some creeks mostly in this river now i will say like just for y'all's benefit they they are trying to expand that 146 survey um, and I've actually added a random component to it, so it's it's more expansive. And some of that comes from the feedback we get from peer reviews. We try to try to adjust for our weaknesses and make the surveys more robust, so in the future they're more useful. So, hey, um, on the, you you had mentioned that there are mainly two-year-old fish that are being harvested. <laughs> Would the change in in mesh size from Say, for example, for unattended gill, small mesh gill nets, you can't use a less, you could have to use less than a four inch mesh net. That's a relatively recent change. Does that have any bias in terms of, of, of the age groups that are being harvested? Um, Just curious. Certainly possibly could. I, I think most of the time we allow less than five, though, unless I'm. I mean, not, you're, but you're, you can't use a large mesh gill net. Which now is a four inch mesh gill net in a, in a small mesh net. I think for run around nets, we allow anything less than five most times. That's what the proclamation just came out. Yeah, so I'm talking about. But Brent, I mean, even a big, a big row mullet is four and a half inch webbing would be a, a really big mullet, would it not? Yeah, got, the way the head should structure it. Yeah, it's yeah, four inch, four and a half inch net. That's a big row mullet net that you would use. So that's that's going to catch your bigger. I mean, I mean, if you're up in the creeks catching creek mullet, <laughs> When you talk about your five, six, seven, eight pounders, that that's you know, maybe you might have a five inch net for that, but I don't know maybe people specifically target that size fish. Yes, but the small mesh gill net fishery harvests a lot of mullet. Sure. Is that right, Brent? Yeah. I mean, you know, they you know, so that that gear has been changed from a four inch to less than a four inch. So I'm wondering it but but that, that's just sense here. Right, but you're talking about just in a in an anchor 
an anchored, anchored yes an anchored most most of the fish are caught so so most of your fish are caught right around is i think it's 70 70 80 percent is running around that yes i think but, you're right but, but what they're leaving out of the study is where you didn't have these restrictions as you're talking about they've been fairly recent so if you go back and look at that large year number one year in history you had a whole 12 month period of landings of mullets by set nets they didn't have 50 yard setbacks. They didn't have 200 yard setbacks. They didn't have three day fish restrictions. They had to fish 24 7, 365 days a year. That's encompassed in landings that you're showing if you're large this year. But yet this year, you're taking a season that's very restricted. You're restricted by gear, restricted by access where you can fish, and you still had the fifth largest landing ever recorded in the state. Least amount of commercial fishermen you ever had. It, I mean, if you'd have had all the same parameters that you had that largest year, this year would have been bigger than that. It's possible. I don't, I don't know the answer, but it's possible for sure. I understand what you're saying. So, keep talking about that. So if we have uh, striped mullet. Uh, supplement discussion in May. But we also still have Strike Mullet uh, Amendment 2. So we're going to keep talking about it. We will all be here again to talk about it. Um, but no, I didn't answer the question. I don't know if we helped. <laughs> no, I think I think, I think <laughs> the answer is that they were still trying to. Quantify some of the data, and they were yeah. going back, and, and then they both they said that they were going back and looking at it. a lot of this stuff came at the very last meeting, and yeah. you know they did. We got the landers from the division, but they didn't even have, they didn't even have them themselves right. to show what what the landers were for the year because yeah. they hadn't been hundred percent right. vetted because the trip ticket program, you know, it's like yeah. uh, just just checking everything, making sure it's there. Yeah, and, and that's fine. And I mean, yeah, you know, we're just we're look, looking at numbers. I'm just looking at. When you really look at it and think about it logically the way you should, there's something wrong with this picture that you're using a supplement when you already had a management measure in place. You're wasting a lot of resources that should be utilized somewhere else. That's just one. Right? That's where I'm at with it. That's all. Mm -hmm. I'm good. We can move. On. <laughs> <laughs> to that point, when's the next assessment? You guys have that. Right, Mullet. I well, they would try to get Amendment 2 in place, and then based on the management that comes out of Amendment 2, they probably would want a few years of data to assess. Amendment 2, would, correct me, the timeline would be um, next fall, I think. Is I believe the... Yeah, the supplement could possibly go in place if they pass it. For the fall, but we would have the uh, amendment, I think. Oh yes, yes. Ready to be voted on by the commission by next fall is what I'm saying. So. So I believe tentatively we have uh, it's October. There is the first. I think it's the review of the draft FMP coming here for Amendment Two. Yeah, I'm looking at fall um, winter. So unless that schedule changes, um, that should be the first draft review. October. So that'll be the first time that you see the, the beginning of the FMP or the amendment to that's what I think. <clears throat> okay. Are there other questions? Well, how would that fit in the commission timeline? So if it comes here October. Uh I don't know. Let me ask. Do you have the timeline? I don't have it. Yeah. Time. I think we may have pushed it back um, a couple months. Um, yeah. Just think it's relevant to the discussion here. Yeah, definitely. But I think the supplement would be in place if if it passes, right? It would be next fall. And I think by the following fishing, the mullet season in the fall, it would be under the amendment if it passed. But I just can't remember the exact that it would be put in place. Yeah, I was thinking summer.
So to yeah, it's got pushed back to November. So you'll see it in January. And then final approval would be May of 2024. Yep, that's what's on the plan right now. Other questions about other things? This is the time. God's here. <laughs> Is it possible to get that written, that timeline, like written down and published? Yeah, so that's on the work plan, the, the NFC work plan. Website? Uh, those are published with the briefing materials. Okay. The there should be one for each of our plans that are in progress. Yeah. I just couldn't remember it up here. Very well. We pushed it back a couple months, I think. That's what got me off. We did. We yep. pushed it back. It was supposed to come to. Uh, August and now it's going to be in November. Very good. So, it was, so one quarter. <clears throat> okay. We moving on to the uh, July. Yes. Joint. Lucas said it's contentious as well as being he appreciate if you stay there a little longer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna I'm I'm um, dial a friend, dial um, Ann Zapp and Jeff right quick. Okay. Um, okay, so your July workshop. So um, we have, so we sent out a form for everybody to fill out. We we're trying to find a date that would work for everybody. And anything you know. So over 50% of the respondents um, uh, told us that July 10th is the best day. That's the Monday um, of the first week. So uh, July 10th, we're going to be holding the July advisor shop, holding it at the aquarium here in Pine Shores. And we did look for locations uh, more centrally located. We know a lot of travel, uh, just trying to make it convenient for ourselves. Um, but because our missions align and we're both state agencies, we were able to get the aquarium at a reduced cost. Um, so we have um, haven't signed a contract with them. So that's where it's going to be. Um, because we were able to get it at a reduced cost, we are going to be able to afford some travel. So if we can help people with hotel rooms um, and just travel to make sure we can get as many people. Oh, we plan to have it. It's going to be during the day. So um, we're planning from 10 to 3 just to allow for travel. Well, what, what will it be that about? I'm sorry. So the goal is to... <laughs> We've had requests now that we've started to meet regularly and trying to get people re-engaged. Um, we've had requests to talk about sort of, uh, for example, what FMPs are in progress and what does that schedule look like? Um, what does the FMP process look like? Um, stock assessments, how do we do those? Um, things like that. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to have um, some amount of uh, presentations by staff. They're going to be sort of high level overview process um, presentation. So it's not going to be specific species. It'll be more um, how to, uh, operations discussions, things like that. And then um, we're also going to have time for discussions between AC members. So it'll be all five ACs meeting at the same time. So um, you'll be able to meet your fellow advisors. And we're going to take the opportunity to sit everybody down, let you talk to each other. Um, and we're probably going to, we're working with a meeting facilitator right now, um, develop sort of a more structured plan just to make sure we get, um, get out of it. So it's not, it's not solidified yet, but we are working on it. And as soon as we have more information, then we'll be sending that around to the group. Just want to make one comment is when I was back on the commission, um, I was able to 
get a series of these publications mm -hmm. on stock assessments and they're not a I, I'm not able to get us a, a lot of them now but I just wanted to show you this that this might be something valuable that EMF might want to consider getting for both the commissioners and for the for the advisory commission uh, advisory committee people Alan? they're excellent publications <laughs> I'm just bringing that in. five of those squirreled away in my office. Good I have you. dug through um, the dusty depths oh. of the. <laughs> well, I think they'd be very valuable for yeah. both the commission and for yeah. you. In the, I don't know what it was about the 90s, but there was a little bloom of fabulous outreach documents that were printed. Um, and those, I agree, it would be great to have some updated. Material and there's a lot of really good website material now, um, but there's nothing like being able to have something yeah. to look at. Yes, I agree, and yes, that's our goal. Um, also, to make some infographics that explain the processes. So, if you're like, where the heck are we in this process with things? Something that you can refer to easily that explains exactly what is tonight. Um, that's something that we're working on. So, yes, I agree. All right. Um, all right, so we're going to be sending out uh, requests for your information. Um, so please keep an eye out in your emails. If we send out a form, uh, we are going to try to, we do need to get an actual count of who's going to be attending. Um, we are going to try to provide a virtual option if people cannot participate. Um, it will not be the same. So I really highly um, encourage you to try to participate in person if you're available to make it. Um, yes. So you're going to get all ACs together. And we've had many opportunities to meet and, and vote on different things in certain situations. Yeah. Repetition being one of them different than the uh, but I think a lot of those committees inter interact with each other and know each other to begin with. Uh, but I would think that that would be a good opportunity being you're going to have a majority of them in one place at one time to kind of touch on what you and I were talking about, maybe to educate them a little bit more about stock assessments, or maybe you can have someone there to speak, maybe even Mr. Buck or someone that, that can, can educate a little bit on, on some of that. And and uh, then I think also it would be very important to have someone to educate from the aspect of the economic benefit of all of the fisheries to the state of North Carolina and the importance of and how they drive the economy, not only recreationally, but also commercially. Did you hear that, Jeff? You just got a volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so yes, that is, that's the goal of this. Um, so uh, the other thing is, one of the things I found when I was rifling through somebody's files is um, a report from 2004 so back in 2004, um, they did a, an advisory workshop, and this is loosely based on that. Um, they did it specifically to look at um, the FRA and how it was going so far, basically. Mm -hmm. So they got all five ACs together. They discussed it, good, what was bad, things that make sense for And so, um, you know, we're now, uh, we're celebrating our 200th year. Um, we are thinking there's been a lot of talk about wanting fisheries reform. Um, fisheries looks really different now than it did in 1997. So it's an opportunity for us to sit down with these, you know, ACs and talk about, uh, we're not going to be so focused. Those were really heavily focused on FRA items. But really to sit down and talk about what are your expectations of your participation in this AC? What do you, you know, how do you see your fisheries? Uh, what do you want to see your fisheries look like in 20 years? Things like that. So, so that's the reason I mentioned that because that you, you educate yeah. um, on all aspects and all parties. Right. Because there's an important part of this puzzle of every aspect of it, the recreational, the consuming, 
the harvester. Right. Um, and one thing that, and I'm sure Jeff can attest to this, one thing when you have young students come down, and you, there's two parts in commercial fishery. One part is harvest regulation and how you manage the stock to get it to that point. And then by the time they get it on the vessel, now it kind of changes. Now it's not harvest anymore. Now it's commerce. So people are very um, surprised when they get on a vessel and they start to learn the aspect of the harvest side and some of the devices and sizing that you have to use and the way you have to operate, uh, the way that you're monitored, you know, with BMS machines, potentially some vessels having cameras on them. Uh, and then, then when they leave from kind of that, we can break that point, not a, not a fish or, or seafood is on the boat. Now you start talking about what it took in groceries and fuel to harvest that. And, and so, and then where it creates employment and it creates food production for the nation. And then on the other side of that one, what the importance is as tourism and people coming to the coast to be able to enjoy that, that fishery and the care of children out and harvest fish uh, for recreational pleasure and for food. So I think there, it all gets lost. It all gets lost in the contentious aspect of, you know, you took this or I don't have that. It's going to be this next discussion on special trout. You know, it all gets lost. And that's sort of the place that you can have those conversations and in a structured way, but not in a overbearing way. Right. Yeah. And that's the goal. Right. So one, one thing that's always kind of bothered me, and when you read the FMPs, they always, one line they mention that they've looked at environmental variables, habitat's real important. And there's been an incredible amount of work done by DMF, uh, started by Mike Street and carried on with habitat. And yet, it doesn't seem, I guess, it doesn't seem like we're pushing that enough. Or, or I, I realize that the DMF and the commission has can only do a certain amount. They can't deal with agricultural problems and forestry problems and things of that nature. But it, I would love to see a little bit more concern about habitat and particularly how it has impacts the life histories of some of these fishes. So, I mean, this is just something that has bothered me when I read the FMPs. It's kind of like, yeah, we do collect these environmental variables, but the only thing we could deal with basically is cold stunts, say with spotted sea. Nothing about, you know, what requirements these life histories of these fishes during their life history, what do they require? And how is that being impacted? We might not be able to do anything about it. We can make it be heard, and somebody might listen. So, I wonder what you're doing this. I was at Water Quality Advisory Committee meeting. Yes, and yes, and I was on it. <laughs> okay, so we're and, meeting, and they have asked that specific question. So, they have said, what can we do as the Habitat and Water Quality Committee to bring these issues, you know, as, a, as an expert little, you know, advisory committee, how can we look at those issues and help you, the division, and advise the commission on how to look at those habitat and water quality issues as they might affect spotted sea trout or as they might affect striped mullet or other species? So that's actually something that um, you know the the chair of the of the that committee has specifically, almost in those same terms, asked us to look at. Um, and intends to look at with that committee. So um, I'm not joking. That's a good place for that to be heard. That's their that's sort of their charge is to look at those those pieces of that. So and now with the new director, Doug Rader, I think I would be hoping that that would be come a little bit more pushed to the front or yes, it is. Yep. Absolutely. All right, thank you. That was really good feedback. And as we continue planning, we will um, keep you updated. And if you don't hear from us, probably because we got busy, and you can feel free to um, email us or call us if you're just wondering what the heck is going on. Um, we're there, we're just doing stuff. Wow.
<laughs> so, but we will try to send out fairly regular emails to let you know where we are in planning stages and as we get agenda set and timing and hotels set and all that. So, all right. That wraps up everything for me. <laughs> and we are moving on to spotted sea trout. He and Jason Rock. Uh, some of you may be familiar with Jason Rock. Uh, he's a while. Lucas joined us more recently. Take us away. All right. <laughs> so, as I mentioned, I'm Lucas Pence here. I'm a, a biologist out of the Moorhead City office here. Uh, and I am one of the co leads for the Spotted Sea Trout Fishery Management Plan. Uh, Jason is our is my uh, counterpart for tonight. Uh, he couldn't make it tonight. Uh, so, I'm flying solo. We'll see how it goes. Um, so the scoping period for Amendment 1 of the Spotted Sea Trout Fishery Management Plan uh, took place from March 13th through 24th. And we actually had over 700 people participate in that uh, process, either by coming to a meeting or by leaving public comment uh, through our online questionnaire. Uh, so for most of the topics, I'm just going to give a brief, uh, you know, in a second here, a brief overview of the comments that we heard. And for most of these, I do just want to point out that uh, Comments varied from uh, strongly for these things to strongly against these things to everything in between. Um, but this is just kind of a high level overview of what we heard, the hints we heard, uh, how we were uh, So after that, I'll be happy to, to you know, answer any questions that you all might have or uh, hear your input for things you'd like us to consider. Um, we just wanted to hear your solution. We're not there yet. <laughs> You're skipping too far ahead. <laughs> we won't get there. Um, but at this point, this is just more about uh, ideas. Uh, but we'll have solutions eventually. Um, so I'm going to start breaking these out. I broke these out by uh, the potential management strategies. Uh, so I'll start with sustainable harvest. Uh, comments about sustainable harvest centered around uh, not implementing a quota in the spot of sea trout fishery, uh, seasonal closures. Bag limit reductions, trip limit reductions, and increasing the minimum size limit. Uh, for recreational management, I I'll break these into uh, comments we heard that were spotted some child specific, and then comments we heard that were more uh, general and would would be would apply to more fisheries than just spotted sea trout. Uh, so for the spotted sea trout specific comments, too many S's. Uh, comments centered around making spotted sea trout a game fish. Uh, outreach, especially around catch and release best practices, uh, removing the uh, recreational commercial gear license as a valid license to harvest spotted sea trout with, uh, implementing boat limits, eliminating the captain and crew limits, and then limiting entry to the spotted sea trout fishery. The more general uh, recreational management things that we heard were about reducing the impact of tournaments, uh, specifically catch and release tournaments. Uh, and then a variety of uh, implementing a variety of gear requirements. For commercial management, I did the same thing, broke it into spotted sea trout specific and more general. Uh, as far as spotted sea trout specific commercial management comments, those centered around making uh, uh, the spotted sea trout fishery, fishery exclusively a hook and line fishery, and also around limiting entry into the spotted sea trout fishery. The more general commercial uh, comments that we heard were about reducing overall uh, gill net effort, reducing overall commercial effort in general, uh, closing the personal consumption loophole, uh, using commercial subsidies as a way to phase out gill nets, uh, limiting the area that areas that commercial fishing is uh, allowed, increasing gill net mesh size. That might be the first time that I didn't stumble over that one in three meetings. Uh, requiring gill net attendance regardless of uh, time of year or area. Whew. Next management strategy was protecting spawning stock biomass. Uh, comments there centered around implementing a slot limit, uh, implementing a bag limit uh, uh, decrease, 
increasing minimum size and uh, our cold stun closure protocol. Uh, we did add another um, potential management strategy due to the comments that we heard, uh, and that was kind of a more area-based management. Um, so kind of the whole point of the scoping process is to hear uh, input both on the management strategies that we have, but then we also want to hear things that uh, we weren't necessarily thinking of, and this is a great example of that. Uh, so as far as that is concerned, uh, what we heard was uh, comments in this area centered around closing all areas to gill nets, closing all areas to all spotted sea trout fishing um, with any gear, uh, and then implementing more regional or localized management. Uh, as Laura mentioned earlier, we did also uh, ask folks for their input on uh, Commissioner Cross's proposal from the February MFC meeting. And I will say, overwhelmingly, uh, comments were against his proposal and felt that it was uh, unnecessary within the spotted sea trout fishery at this time. Um, most of those comments centered uh, for the specific pieces of that, centered around not implementing quota in the spotted sea trout fishery and then not ending uh, catch and release fishing. There were some other general ideas that didn't really fit into any of those uh, management strategies specifically, and those centered around uh, ecosystem or multi-species management, uh, stocking fish, specifically spotted sea trout, although I think probably some folks would have said across the board to just stock everything, uh, increasing enforcement efforts, looking at uh, management in other states and mirroring our management off of those states, and then uh, developing a recreational reporting app for spot and sea trouts uh, and having uh, either mandatory or uh, voluntary reporting through that app. So that wraps up what we heard. Uh, happy to answer any questions that you all might have, or at least attempt to answer them. You put a statement. First, for the record, I'm going to send Commissioner Cross a bill for services rendered for the hundreds of phone calls I have had to deal with regarding his proposal. So thank you, Commissioner Cross, for the last two months of my life. Good question regarding, yeah, just you know, listening to all the possible benches. What other states, what other states in our region are actually managing spots? I mean, I would say all of them are to varying degrees. Um, Virginia has management that's, uh, at least on the recreational side, very similar to ours. So, and I, I, don't mean, like, I don't mean that respect. I guess more of a, you know, the idea of this is to develop an FMP dealing with spotted sea trout. Yep. So do these other states have these types of documents? I mean, everybody's got, you know, recreational you know, bag limits and sizes and all that sort of thing. I just mean looking at spotted sea trout to the degree we're proposing to go down the road to look at them many of them do not uh, it would a, a document of this type would require uh in my mind at least if you can jump in and correct me if you disagree with this uh you need a stock assessment to do management at this level in my opinion and a lot of uh states uh south carolina georgia uh, a lot of the northern gulf states uh, they're not doing stock assessments where they haven't done them for many years. Um, Who is assessing them? So well, I'll add to a little bit, you can answer that part. Um, so Atlanta States Marine Fisheries Commission does have a fishery management plan for spotted sea trout. Um, it does not have specific, what we call compliance requirements. I think other than a minimum size limit, yes, it has to be of what, 12 inches or? 12 inches, yeah. That's the minimum that a state can do. So they do have, a plan through that. They do also recommend in that plan that states manage their fishery for at least 20% spawner potential ratio, which is like a measure of the biomass of the fishery. Um, having said that, North Carolina does have this thing called the Fisheries Reform Act, and spotted sea trout is a recreationally significant species. So by statute, we are required to manage our fishery at the state level. Um, for sustainable harvest, and that's what a stock assessment allows us to do, which is why we did a stock assessment. Um, I don't want to jump ahead because you can probably answer the questions. Other states do have stock assessments. Other states do have issues with overfishing. Um, and but if you want to elaborate on that, because you have slightly more background than I do. So it's a combined North Carolina and Virginia stock. 
So Virginia is, you know, their stock is in the exact same boat that ours is. Um, in Florida, which is if you keep moving down the uh, Atlantic coast there, that's the next state you come to that does a stock assessment. In I think they have their state broken up into, I think, four or five they, they different regions. regions. Yeah. Uh, all of those regions in their most recent stock assessment, except the southern region, uh, overfishing was occurring. Or at least that was my best read. There's yeah. a little harder to understand uh, those. Um, uh, now I'm losing. Uh, yeah, the metric, the, their threshold and their, um, yeah, you know, where their stock status designations are. Um, but my understanding was that everywhere but the southern region, overfishing was occurring. Um, as you're moving across the coast, uh, Alabama, Mississippi, uh, they do not have recent stock assessments. Louisiana does. Uh, I think in 2021 was their most recent. Bad stock is overfished. Overfishing is occurring, and abundance. Uh, their estimate of abundance is at uh, some of the lowest levels in uh, probably any of our lifetimes. <laughs> um, it's been a long time since they've seen abundance that low. Uh, and if you keep going around, um, Texas. Their most recent stock assessment, I think overfishing was occurring, but it's, it's pretty old um, and they no longer manage their fishery by uh, stock assessments. Um, they use indices of abundance and things along those lines. Uh, but I believe in their last one, overfishing was occurring as well. Um, and they just had, in I think it was 2021, they had that massive cold stun. Uh, that they are just now coming out of their, they had, especially in their southern uh, basins, they put in some extremely restrictive uh, management that they're, I think, they're not even out of it. I think they're out of, they'll be out of uh, come August. So I was at the Gulf Council meeting last week, um, representing the South Atlantic Council, and I spoke with some of the officials from Texas, and I thought they did some really innovative stuff in their speckled trout fishery. You know, having that maximum size limit as part of a, a slot with a lower bag limit in the years following a cold stun. I don't know if they close all harvest, but I was speaking to them, I thought it was really interesting, it was really innovative. So it's, you know, I think, um, what, what is their size limit right now? It's like, I think like, I'm going to get it wrong, something like 16 to 22 or something, but they just slow. Yeah, but, but since they have the cold stun, I think they closed it for a while, and then when it's open, it's like instead of five fish, it's two, and you can't harvest any fish over 22 inches as to help build that spawning stock. They do. Um, so they manage by bay system, yeah. I think. Yeah. So I think they had a couple of bays that they are open, like at the three, three, three fish with the slot limit right now, or maybe it's five fish. And I think one they reduced to three fish. Yeah, the Madre. Um, yeah, it's because of the cold stun. Yeah, I don't know. I think so. They shut the whole thing down. Yeah, they have in the past. Yeah. For some period. They brought, you know, they brought it back. Yeah, so it's pretty interesting, but the, I mean, spotted sea trout are actively managed at different state levels. It's just like South Carolina and Georgia, they don't do stock assessments. They defer to like Land States Marine Fisheries Commission for most of their management, or they go through their, like in South Carolina specifically, their management funnels through their state legislature, but they, they don't really have a Marine Fisheries Commission that can implement rules like we do, um, kind of goes through their legislative. So it's, each state's kind of set up a little bit different in how they manage. It's a, I was going to say it wasn't a case. I was just curious because it wasn't a case of you know we should you know tailor ours like some other state. It was just curious as to who was who was really getting into the whole. I think a lot of what we see is that uh, folks, especially in the southern portion of the state, see that they can uh, cross down to South Carolina and they can eat ten fish. And I believe that's a lot of. Or folks, we heard a lot of South Carolina and Louisiana are the biggest ones that kept coming up. And it's because you can eat 10 fish in South Carolina and 25 fish. Well, it's the same. It's like the flounder. I mean, the people down the south end of the state would jump down to South Carolina during flounder season. It's the same. Same yeah. idea. So you can catch more. You can keep more flounder in South Carolina. Do other Thanks. states have a slot limit aside from Texas? They, they have a periodic. Florida does, I think, mm -hmm. in maybe all of their. The theirs are theirs gets real complicated because it varies based on region. Does Virginia have one fish over? I think Virginia has a trophy limit, so it'd be a slot limit with one fish over. Um, Texas has a slot limit. I don't remember the. Um, I lived in Mississippi for a while, so I should know that answer, but I, I don't say they have something. Yeah, they're pretty. Um, <clears throat> do do we yeah. share data with other states as far as like what works, what doesn't work? Can we look at Texas, for example? 
you know, or your marine fishery, fisheries folks able to chat with theirs and, and look at their historical data, stuff they've put in place, impact it's had, et cetera. You guys communicate with other states and everything. Yeah, I mean, we definitely could. Uh, so I will say, like, our peer review panel, yeah. um, the head of Texas Fisheries was on panel for our stock assessment peer review. And the other person was it, it was Mike, Mike Murphy from Florida, yeah, Florida yeah, who's yeah. been there for stock assessment for Red Drum, Spotted Sea Trout for years down there. He's retired now, but, um, and then the other person was um, Joe, Hightower. Joe Hightower from NC State who did the work with with um, Tim Ellis and stuff on the tagging stuff and Dr. Buckle. So, I mean, that's, we collaborate all the time with other states. Now, every state's different and the way their management set up is different. And yeah. Spotted Sea Trout's a little bit different because while ASMC does have a plan, they don't really dictate or not actively managing spotted sea trout. They just kind of have like a, a baseline of regulations and recommendations on how to manage. But it's up to the states to do it and to manage if they if they so desire at, at the moment. Can I ask a question? I'll probably get bombarded here from every black <laughs> whoever else. <laughs> One thing that's always kind of concerned me is that with species like spotted sea trout, I would assume there's some pretty decent uh, mortality, discard mortalities. And then you take with southern flounder, I mean, rec recreational hook and line is probably a lot less. So there's, it seems like there's a, a certain number of species that are, whether they're gray trout or speckled trout, that where we have a high amount of discard mortalities. And the thing that's always gone on in my old crazy mind is, why don't we just go ahead and forget about size limits? I know that you've got to give a fish that chance to spawn, but if we just had a bag limit, if you want to take a 12 inch trout, whatever, three or four, whatever the bag limit is, take it. Now I know there'll be people that'll, you know, looking for that bigger one, but is this, Am I talk? I mean, I'm an old man, so <laughs> I mean, am I am I talking crazy? Or but there are certain species that you know a lot of the offshore fishes and so forth and so on. I mean, the discard mortality on these things is incredible, but you got to throw them back, and they're going to die. Red drum's another one. I mean, you know, uh, should we have a size limit on these things? So we. Our discard mortality rate that we used uh, in the stock assessment was for the for recreation the recreational sector was was ten percent, and that comes out of a, a study that was conducted uh, right here in North Carolina. Um, pretty standard operating procedure as far as uh, discard mortality studies go. Uh, they caught some fish, hook and line, held them in pens, observed them for I think it was three days. Um, you know, recorded uh, mortality rates, um, and in the end, that came out to uh, you know the difference between fish that are caught in saltier water and fish that are caught in fresher water. That averages out to about ten percent. Um, so I guess I would look at that, and and I would worry a little bit that we would be, uh, you know, right now any fish below fourteen inches, uh, if it's caught and released, on average. We assume about 10% of those die. Uh, if we open up harvest to those, I would worry that we're we're potentially removing a much much larger uh, portion of those fish, and potentially uh, before they get a chance to spawn. Although for female fish, even even at 12 inches, uh, you know they're I think 88% of them or something. They're, 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 like. Yeah, so they definitely <laughs> mature very very <laughs> early. So there's a. You know, there's a recruitment time for these fish, so those spikes show up in the fall. Those 10, 12, 13 inch spikes, you can catch. If you want to sit there and catch them, you can catch a hundred of them on one point of marsh. And I think that's the issue you run into. Um, people leave those fish alone if they can't keep them most of the time. It's, I mean, I bet there's probably some people who will sit there and catch them just to say he caught a hundred trout. But, um, but letting those fish get to 14 inches the next spring those fish spawn. And I, I I mean, me personally, from my perspective, if you look at spotted sea trout biomass and the model, 
after we went through the 14-inch size limits, really after we saw that increase in biomass go up a lot. Um, so I think letting those fish spawn is, is pretty good. I, I think your theory is right. I think there probably is a breaking point where catch and release mortality is high enough that you want to just have a catch and release fishery. I think there may be some literature out there. For some reason, something like 30 or 40 percent release mortality comes to mind as like sort of a breaking point. Of where, but you're talking about 90 percent of the fish surviving, um, and that's not just not specific. I think Florida actually uses 8 percent in their stock assessment, and I think Louisiana and Texas are around 10 percent as well. So we're right on par, even though it's a North Carolina specific study. We're right on par with what other states are using from their independent studies that they've done. And in the stock assessment itself, there's a table with 10 or 12 other studies that were done. But I think what you'll see in there, if you look at it, it's just all over the board. So if, if you're live baiting with treble hooks, you're going to have 50% mortality. You're going to see trout floating away when you release them, you know. I mean, that's fine if you keep your four fish and catch some nice big trout. but don't keep doing it after you catch your four. <laughs> um, people, people catching them and lip hooking them, th those fish survive for the most part. The, the main factors we found were salinity was a factor. Fresh water seems to be at higher mortality. Um, but then some kind of trauma or bleeding of the fish, obviously hooked in the gills or hooked in the esophagus, that type of thing. Those fish have low survival rate. But those fish hooked in the lip is... Those fish almost, it was lower than 10%. So if you can educate people to use methods that lip hook the fish and don't cause the trauma to the fish, they, they do really well. Spotted sea trout is a soft bodied fish, like you said. So you kind of um, feel like those, a lot of those fish are going to die relative to like a red drum or even a flounder, like you mentioned. But it's really as much about the trauma that's caused to the fish through the handling and the hooking that's going to cause the mortality. So yeah, the reason I bring this up on page seven in the in the peer review that was done by Joe Hightower and Mike Murphy. And could I read this? Yeah, sure. So we suggest a lower emphasis on commercial monitoring for this species because of the relatively minor impact commercial commercial fishing on the stock. Recreational discard should be the primary focus, and in parentheses and a high rather than low priority because of the trend in magnitude of recreational catch and release. And that's what, when I read that, that's what made me think, well, I mean, we really, looking at this, there's been an, obviously there's been an increase in recreational fishing. And if there's going to be a lot more of this catch and release, to me, there's going to be a lot more discord mortality. And that's where I came up with well, maybe in the right direction on, on putting these size limits. I mean, that's what I'm asking. And I don't know whether anybody's even looked into this. You know, what contribution do these fish make to the spawning population? Is there a good stock and recruitment relationship between these fish? Does anybody know? I can't remember off the top of my head, but the... There is a small organization that's somewhat vocal that is here in eastern North Carolina that has been advocating for regulations where they removed bag limits, they removed size limit, or excuse me, not bag limits, but size limits, entered a requirement that if you caught it, it had to contribute to your bag. You could not release any fish because of the delayed mortality issues with different uh, fish species. The biggest opposition I'd heard to that was the feeling that it was totally unenforceable. That that, and you know, I think biologically that has a lot of merit. Yes, there'll be a lot of small fish caught, but if, if you've got a bag limit of five fish and you catch three and you have to keep them, you know, and you've removed lot. three small fish. You've not removed uh, primarily large spawning fish out of the population. But I think, you know, this discussion on size limits kind of isn't applicable to the nature of this fishery. This, you know, I mean, a lot of this is a catch and release fishery. People aren't going out to catch five fish and kill five fish. I, I, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not arguing saying. that. I'm just saying this is a different concept that might have some merit along the lines of what he was 
was saying, and I don't know that anybody's ever really talked about that. Seriously. It's come up, it came up with flounder and some other species. I think your point's valid as a something that should be fleshed out in the plan. I think that's good feedback. Um, if we're Lucas and, and the crew to kind of look at the pluses and minuses of that type of management and, you know, the biological implications and, you know, there's going to be obviously some, I will call it social or economic implications of that as well, which we don't necessarily get into as much, but, um, you know, we're looking at the fish and the health of the stock, but that would and be for the these conditions. smaller fish, there's, excuse me, with, with these smaller fish, there's greater mortality. You know, so you have that to bring in and, and I don't know how you figure this out. Yeah, you know, whether this is going to have an impact on the stock or not. But I'm just bringing this up. But as far as catch and release is concerned, I, I fish catch and release all my life, but I'm a freshwater trout fisherman. But we're using an 18, 20, 20, you know, inch fly with a, with a barbless hook. That's a big difference. It doesn't have to be barbless. No, but I'm saying, it, well, but I mean, this is this is what a good catch and release fisherman does. Use a barbless hook. So I mean, I use a lot of barbless hooks. Yeah, I'm not saying. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm just. I'm, just, saying, I mean, I'm, I'm offering that just to you. Yeah, I know. Yeah. So. The thing is that yes, but well, yes, you're right. Okay. But we have hundreds of catch and release fisheries, fresh and salt water across the country that have discards, right? This is how you manage. Thank you. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say that his point, having a slot limit for trout, won't that increase? mortality to buy here. So it would, like you would you would certainly expect uh, an increase in discard mortality, but but what we try to look at is overall fishing mortality. So that's the combination of harvest and discard mortality. So what you really have to do in that is is I, I think like Lee said, part of the plan is going to be where is that uh, where is that breaking if you implement a, a slot limit, uh, let's say you know, 20 inches for argument's sake, every fish over 20 inches has to be released. You change that, uh, you know, potentially from uh, you know the fish that would normally have been harvested. You change that from 100% discard mortality rate, or a 100% mortality rate, I should say, because they're harvested, to a 10% delayed mortality rate. So it's still a, a, a potentially a, a huge decrease in overall mortality even though we do see discard mortality would increase somewhat. But really what we're looking at is that overall mortality picture. So the combination of both of these, we can get, I mean, if we could get discard mortality to zero, it'd be great. And it, it might solve our problem. <laughs> we might uh, no longer be over fishing. But isn't that? But I don't know that that is, I don't know that's possible. Yeah. So if you're, if you're removing like if you look at your F rates, whatever, you're moving 30, 40% of your biomass every year from harvest. And then you return, you turn that a lot of that harvest into discards because of regulations. I mean, essentially what you've done is 90% of those fish that are released now, they get another year to spawn. And that's, you know, keeping you from that recruitment over fishing and having good recruitment the following year, potentially. I mean, of course, environmental, all those things are big factors with the estuarine dependent fish like spotted sea trout. But that's what you're doing is you're essentially putting those fish back in the water. The bigger fish presumably you're gonna have Yeah, you know, I'm all gun that can, yeah. my point if you have a slot from you know, proposal eighteen to twenty two. Mm -hmm. What whatever it could be. But you're out there you're yeah. catching trout that are seventeen inches all day long. You can't keep those two. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah, and that's the trade-off. Yes, you're exactly. And that's so that's but the guy that's out there. Right. I mean, he's gonna keep fishing all day long to get his four mm -hmm. fish in this. I think what you're bringing up is the thing we struggle with, with seasons, with size limits, with bag limits, with everything is fishing behavior, and it's so hard for us to predict what the fishing behavior is gonna behavior is gonna be. You close the season, you think maybe it's going to reduce effort, but if everybody keeps fishing, discards go up, then all of a sudden it's like a, it's maybe not a complete minus, but it's not the reduction you thought you were going to get. And that's. It, it, it seems like at this point with with um, release mortality, and it's something you can't necessarily legis legislate, but it, it just seems like the state 
anglers, clubs need to really address proper care and handling and and release tactics to be able to I'm sorry. Oh, no, no. <laughs> to 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 address this on a personal level. Absolutely. Yeah. And and um it, it this is serial overfishing that we want people to continue fishing and we want to keep having this wonderful access to this fishery and to me there doesn't seem to be a way around it anymore if you're going to put more and more people onto the fishery you're going to have to that's something that's going to have to be worked on and i, I don't see how how you can actually mandate that but i think just a lot of more public education and i think to you to what you were saying if you were a freshwater fisherman especially a trout fisherman these catch and release practices are instilled from the get-go and it doesn't seem to like from childhood we all understood keep them wet debarb your hooks and i think we just have to start really thinking about that in salt water too yeah. we we cannot like on a 90 degree day and the deck of your boat is well over 100 degrees you drop that fish one time it's done it's halfway fried before you even throw it back and you know all treble hooks oh my god let's yeah, let's not even get started switching to circle hooks for live bait yeah it, it's, it's fantastic the, i think that would yeah. you know i was given a really really yeah. broad overview that would definitely that absolutely you can't be just for single, single, single sense of set of triples on. i do think that is that was under the general uh, uh side of things on purpose because i do think uh that would be a conversation that would have to be broader than the spot to see shot at that day. Uh, because you get into an important issue. You know, that's, we that's say, I think Commission so, did address that with the big circle of paper that staff did a wonderful job on, and there was not a lot of support for it. Well, maybe, you know, that's where this conversation comes back around. It's a conversation about management specific to like, and a question with uh scott whitley yeah y'all hear me yes yes cool um when, so the assessment was done in 2022 right uh yeah it was it was completed yep between what dates in 22. uh so the terminal the terminal year of the assessment is uh 2019. so basically what i'm getting at is we basically did an assessment during covid shutdown Man, so you're looking at all effort jump spike way high, and so we're talking about an effort during a code during a, uh, a pandemic, right? So the actually the terminal year of the assessment is prior to COVID. Um, the last data that went into the assessment was February of 2020. Uh -huh. uh, COVID shutdowns did not start until March of 2020. So the last data that went into that assessment was actually prior to COVID. We, by the time we wrapped everything up, COVID did absolutely delay getting to the uh, um, peer review with the workshop and it did delay getting uh, the assessment approved for management. Um, but data for the assessment is definitely prior to COVID. So, so, so that's three or four years old then? Yeah. Okay. Well, that's, now, we'll say, it, it was either three, it's either old information or it happened during the pandemic, which is a false information anyway. Anything that come out of the last three years, you can throw it out the window, uh, especially for effort in fishing because everybody took off to go fish and hunting and other things like that. So, uh, so now we're just dealing with older information. Okay, that's what I needed to know. Thank you. Spanish. Do, any more discussion? Oh, a question. Sorry. I've been waiting for this Sorry. <laughs> so, I had a question for you. The Atlantic State doesn't manage this, but I have a pretty good idea because of the the cold stun aspect is so hard to manage to begin with because just mother nature manages the fishery pretty difficult uh, 
I have a pretty good idea, and that's why they've never addressed it because it's, it's like a moving target. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that that's the reason. Um, I'm not even sure it's ever really been discussed. You, you, do you have? I can answer some of that. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so they actually talked uh, a bunch of years ago about uh, not uh, managing it at the ASMFC level. Um, but there were some states that really wanted to uh, keep that at a, as an ASMFC uh, managed fish so that they could keep their, uh, you know, there was a lot, there was pressure in the states to basically kind of do away with managing spotted sea trout. Uh, and without that ASMFC backing, um, they weren't uh, really able to, they wouldn't have been able to keep that management going. Um, but the reason ASMFC was, was considering uh, uh, dropping spotted sea trout as a managed fish is because they there's uh, limited evidence that it's a, a right. close by stock. Um, so basically, their compromise was to kick it back to the states and say, you know, we'll give you these kind of base, uh, broad guidelines, but manage it state by state because it's going to be different state by state. So typically, when you go into <clears throat> fisheries management in my mind, especially on the commercial side, you're trying to do that typically through, through your management in either fishing season or through gear sizing. Most of the commercial sea fishery has migrated over just through gear sizing in all aspects, whether it was shellfish, fin fish, flat fish, um, even shrimp uh, to some extent. And when you start to think about how you, in my mind, when we start to think about how do you, how you could try and control effort, you know, there's been a big push for a handful of years now at Mid-Atlantic Council, at Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Council, you're hearing it here at the state level of, of kind of a total retention. It's coming out of Europe, they're ahead of us, you know, they, they've got away from discard fisheries. We're managing this fishery presently, every fishery in this state for waste. We're not managing it for the people of this state, nor the people outside of this state. We're managing it for waste. And at the end of the day, I think that your task and your task is to work a little harder to figure out how not to get the waste in the fishery. I think about it every day. How do we get a little bit more efficient in what we're doing? And how do we try and get rid of that fish every time? This 10% bull that I hear all the time is every meat I've ever been to. Every fish there is, is always as bull of 10%, 10%. Not true. Depends on the time of the year. Depends on how the fish was harvested. Depends on the work condition it came out of. The survey you're talking about right now, that part of the staff that did this, they made them kick out, they let them use treble hooks. They made them kick out some of this stuff. They had to, to harvest the fish in a way that it gave the best result for the for for the long the, the dead discard mortality rate. That's not the way the average person that puts a boat over for the state fishes. You need to do what they do if you want to find out what the true discard mortality rate is. How do you, how do you control a fishery? You control it through limited access. You control them. You control the sizing or the amount of access to the fishery. You control it through gear sizing. Control it through seeding. You control it. Control it through the amount that you take out of the resource. You can't control it by licenses. They're not going to limit the amount of fishing license in this state in salt water. They will how? Get more and more every year. Your education to educate them to try and use a circle hook or a barbless hook. It's going on deaf ears for most of these people. And yeah, they got 70, 80, 90,000 dollar boat. They can't have to drive a car down the road. Now you just put them in the water. They never had a course on how to drive a boat. It's almost ludicrous. But the, the thing that makes the most sense of all of this conversation is at least let them take the first four or ten or five or three fish that they catch out, out of the water, put it in a box, and go to the dock. And if that ain't enforceable, ain't nothing in this state enforceable. Because when that officer sitting over there watching him, he sees something go back overboard. That's a violation. All you got to do is go to it and write him a ticket. 
But I, I think your that, point is 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 interesting, but I don't know if it really applies to some of these inshore fisheries. I mean, the nature of recreational industry is inefficiency, right? It's to I think catch I, ten to maybe keep one. I mean, what? I think our not to discuss biomass here. It's not for recreational fishing or commercial. It's to protect the stock. On higher we get there. Not that disagreeing that with that. Our task is it to protect the biomass. What? No, that's not what I said. I said yes, we are to protect the biomass. Figure out how to protect the biomass. But I'm just saying, if we're going to talk about, you know, you talked about initiatives to go to total bag limits and catch a few fish and catch and quit. I think which was in the Doug Ross proposal. I think yeah, there's a lot of discussion about that. Doing that with, with uh, snap grouper species where you have high discard mortality, right? But um, some of these inshore fisheries, just completely different game. So, so your your American red snapper for many years you couldn't even harvest one because your discard mortality. Oh, out, it's still going on. It took more out of the ACL. It's still going on. Yep. And the ACL even what? But but they finally decided to give them some fish because they realized that was ludicrous and they figured they needed to try and do some trying to manage the fishery a little different because all they were doing was managing for waste. We're managing for waste. Letting a man go out there and catch a hundred trout, eat one or none is ridiculous. And 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 I heard what you said that hopefully the guy moves off of them right. and and some will but some won't because some of them are targeting to catch as many as they can put in the box. Just like a, just a, I'm curious a question just mm -hmm. for your idea. Um, if they catch their one flounder or their one drum, are they done the day or is it is it whatever they're targeting? And I, I mean, because that's, that's the issue we run into is I think that's it's a mixed that's fishery. What you're going to run into with the entire fishery. Yeah. Because because what y'all aren't telling these guys around this table is that in about two years that's what's going to happen anyway because with, with these uh southern flounders mm -hmm. your discard mortality is getting ready to take all your quota it's going to take the commercial and the recreational it's going to exceed it all discard mortality in the southern flounder fishery is going to eat it all up just about there now on, on the wreck side if you really figure the dead discard weight you got to figure that out what what is it like a quarter of a pound I think it was 0.23 or something. Yeah, yeah, but yet the average is two pounds. So go back and refigure the math. You just exceeded it. Yeah, but I think when you update the assessment, you'll adjust what the most recent average weights are for those years, and it. it but we'll have to see how it comes out. There's no extrapolation. There's no guesstimation. If you took three fish out, you took three fish out. If you took five fish out, you took five fish. And the way a lot of this was proposed early on, and when I first heard about it. I'll tell you the same thing. Probably some of y'all think this sounds ludicrous, but I don't know. As long as I've stayed in different aspects of fisheries management, being a binder at the federal level, at the state level, it's starting to obviously make a little bit more sense because whether it's a flounder, whether it's a drum, whether it's a trout, whatever those three or whatever those five or whatever those 10 was, actually the way it's proposed with the total length limit, 100 inches of fish when you got that. Then you just quit. But, but I think that would be hard to enforce. I, like I think that. that would be hard to enforce, but I think a number would be. I, I think when that. you saw one go board that it that it went in the boat. And then I think you would start to fish in a way that we've been fishing for years commercially because I think you hooks don't discriminate. So so I don't know how you ever recreationally fish because they don't discriminate. You can tell it to go out there and catch a red drum, but that don't mean that's what it's gonna bring back. But there's a lot of commercial fisheries that have to discard. That's true, but we're trying every day to get out of doing that, by through, and mostly through gear size, and we've been pretty effective at it. Yeah, and sometimes market conditions, and there's all all different reasons. Another but, example but, is... But if you don't figure out how to quit managing the fishery for waste, you're never going to get it. I 100% I, I agree with you. I, I agree with you on your first point about if you're going to do a hook and line study, you need to mimic what's occurring in the fishery. I mean, that would be a the best type of study to have is if you characterize the fishery, what hook types are people using, you know, sort of the the breadth of what people are using and, and if you could balance it to how many people are treble hook fishing, how many people are bait fishing, how many people are soft bait fishing, that's the way you would want to conduct your study. Um, no matter what nobody thinks here, if there was two fish left, they'd be for them two kids in my opinion to just catch. Right. They ain't got to gotcha. be prepared poultry, but but I think that you got to sit here and you got to figure a way to manage the fishery in a manner that is productive for everybody. And I really think, and people are getting bound up over 
this side gets that, that side gets that. The commercial sector in the inspector trout fishery is very minimal. I've heard it right there in that study, very minimal. It's even probably less, it's even more minuscule now, being you've got restrictions to certain regions. But yet, there's a big sector of the, of the, of the, of the state that thinks the commercial fishery is treating this detriment. The detriment's in a dead discard. So now, if you stop the commercial fishing tomorrow, the dead discard is still going to eat it up if you don't do something about it. And like again, it not only depends on species, but it depends on gear. Take the flounder fishery. You get small flounder in a in a in a, in a small mesh net. I bet you, you it's rare that you'll get a dead discard discard in that flounder. You just flip right out. Red drum is just the opposite. So there, you know, say within the commercial end of it, with small mesh nets, why not, why have a slot? For the red drum, when there's going to be a higher amount of discard, more, discard mortality in small mesh nets, where with southern flounder, there's going to be hardly any discard mortality in smaller mesh nets or large mesh nets. So it's not only it's not only species, but it's also what you know what commercial or recreational. So as far as I'm concerned, I think that as far as red drum, let the commercial people. Take, you know, forget about the size limit, keep the other regulations in place. As far as flounder is concerned, just the opposite. You could have. No, I'll wait. On the flounder. So, you think that a drum fisherman, I'm going to say a drum fisherman, a net fisherman, I don't want to talk about drum. <laughs> Ever want to talk about drum? That's not drum meat. <laughs> but, but I mean, honestly, like, going to keep seven two pound drum or are you going to try to upgrade to get your seven or eight pound 27 inch commercial drum? Fishery? yeah i don't i i mean and that's the well, I mean, it's back to the behavior problem and i think that i'm only using that as an example and i think i think all of y'all's ideas in theory are really good i think there's things that we can address in the plan to I said to look at these ideas and but pluses and minuses of about how you work with the fishery. Try to put them in the area that they inter interact with those fish so you've really reduced the effort or the interaction with drum and rock fish because the way you push the nets off the shore. So, so very few trips occur seven fish to begin with. So I'm with Alan on that. I think that you would keep the fish because you're adding dead discards in that you wouldn't be adding in the fishery and you're going to get to your 250,000 pounds commercially at a faster rate when you get rid of your dis discard. But I don't know that you're going to get there anyway because I think you're so limited with the amount the way that you can fish for them anymore that you're not you're not going to achieve it to begin with. And most most guys are going to avoid red drum. You know, they're fishing for trout or fishing for spa, whatever. They're going to avoid them. You're just not going to go into the marsh. You're going to get further out. So, but anyhow, I'm just, I'm just throwing this stuff out. We've, we've been talking about overfishing, all these different species, how it's occurred all these different years. And to Brent's point, we've been doing gear size. We've been changing these parameters. We've been changing those parameters. And we're about to just start another FMP. And we're going to start talking about gear this or get I think we need to maybe look at this in a different way of maybe of implementing some type of management that's different, not necessarily to some extent, but I was saying he's suggesting looking at it differently. If we've been looking at management in the same way for 20, 30 years in all these different states and we're having overfishing issues, well, there are other factors that involved in over, that cause stocks to decrease, but perhaps we're setting in different parameters that really are more detrimental than beneficial. You know, we have a chance here to think outside the box, to try something different. We're looking at a stock, you know, we're starting fresh. Maybe something that the marine fishers can do, and this is part of this discussion, is say, well, let's try this. I mean, we, we're not going to change anything with the flounder. We just went through this whole big discussion about southern flounder. Now we have the limits and you know, the season and the whole bit, and that's it now implemented for what three years or whatever till we go back. We've got the same thing for drum, yet we still have problems with the fishery. And we've had this discussion about is it who, you know, back to who's to blame. Let's look at doing something a little different. 
let's look at trying something a little different on this one than what we've been doing. Just say, okay, well, here's the FMP for spotted sea trout. It's very similar to the one about flounder. It's very similar to the one about rum. Oh, hell, that's not working. So let's try something a little different. That's my suggestion. Some of these discussions are kind of pushing that way too. Rum has worked pretty well in the state, though, hasn't it? For the most part. Yeah. We haven't been over fishing for 20 years, but I mean, it just depends if you like yeah. a one fish bag limit. I mean, and a seven fish trip limit. I, I mean, it's and a slot limit, but it's worked for the we've met our management targets with the management we've had in place. Um, Is there any data relative to the spotted sea trout that you guys can put a finger to between this last assessment, maybe the previous assessment, which I assume was okay? Uh, because yeah, we hadn't had full some of this, right? Right. For a while. Well, and keep added duck hunter. Keep keep in mind. I don't mean to cut you off. I mean, yeah, no. Keep in mind, we're like two or three times the biomass target. Mm -hmm. So we're management has worked really well. Um, the problem that we had bought at sea trout in this last assessment is just that the terminal year, the removals were, I mean, not. Greatly right. above. So that, we're looking at like a 15% to 20 to 20 percent when you take and count discards um, reduction to get the over to overfishing. So that's the rate of fishing that occurred in that year back down to where it, the, the level would be where we would not be overfishing. So are there, are there data points, I guess, uh, that you guys can look at to figure out where that ever sheer fishing growth or you want I, mean, I don't want, I mean, you're just yeah, speck yeah. trout, man. I'm going to be quiet. <laughs> um, it's an increase in effort, honestly. Um, and I'm, I'm sure, you know, why there's that increase in effort, I would imagine it's a, a wide variety of factors. Part of it is probably the fact that the uh, biomass is so high. There's a lot of fish out there and they're relatively easy to catch. Uh, and, I, and I know when uh, folks uh, hear that uh, people are having good luck uh, catching fish, you're more likely to think, oh, me go out and try and try my hand at it. Um, I think it's also the the uh, spotted sea trout has it, it, historically, I believe, but definitely in recent years, it's been uh, one of the more popular fish to fish for in in North Carolina. Um, and I think there's a lot of reasons for that. I think they're relatively easy to catch. I always like to think of it as it, there's there's just enough finesse uh, that it, that you know someone who is uh, uh, you know, maybe not uh, fishing every single day, can get out there and feel like they're they're tricking the fish, uh, but they're easy enough to catch that, uh, you know, when I take my kids fishing, they don't get bored as, as, as quickly because they can actually have some success. Uh, so I think it's a lot of those things um, that, that all kind of meet together that just have, have driven effort up. And I think the terminal year of the stock assessment was the, the highest year um, in the time series, but we have in the in the two years after that. That was due to recreational landings. So yes and no. Commercial, um, commercial landings have also increased uh, in the last two or three years. But but yeah, I mean, I would say definitely the driver of that is a recreational dominated fishery. The driver of that has definitely been uh, recreational landings, but it, commercial landings have also increased in the in the past two or three years. I'm just quoting what the reviewer said. Yeah, it's I mean it's predominantly, but again, it's like ninety percent of removals come from the recreational fishery. So yeah, absolutely. Sure. Yeah, like that is increases in that sector are are going to be bigger. So could I clarify for Alan like that comment that, that you read from the reviewers? Um the commercial discards are relatively well, actually they're quite low in this fishery. Um a lot of people don't understand that because they think, you know, gill nets have so much bycatch and stuff. But the shape of a spotted sea trout, as you well know, and the selectivity of the gill net, it just doesn't, the gill net mesh sizes people are using don't select um, for undersized spotted sea trout. I mean, you might hang one by his little omer and tooth or, or, or something, but this doesn't happen very often. And that's, you know, when we send our observers out with, with the gill net fishermen, or even in our own independent gill net surveys with, with our three inch webbing that we use, um, we rarely see undersized spotted sea trout. 
So to that point, that's where that's coming from because the fraction of removals that are coming from commercial discards are so low relative to the, you know, the millions of fish that are being released recreationally and applying that 10% to that is a is the impact from that fishery. So um, In the commercial fishery, there's capacity there in those fisheries, right? So people got boats in their backyards. There's a lot of capacity, whether it be people in Oklahoma, people from other states that'll come and fish when the fishing's good. So like we were talking about earlier, when we see when we see land and spike, that probably means means there's a lot of fish around, but you never know what that means relative to the fishing mortality that you're causing in that year. It's really it's kind of hard to gauge. And that's why we always encourage people don't use landings as a, a barometer for what fishing mortality is. Um, certainly when you see things tank and go down to the lowest levels you've ever seen, that's cause for concern. But sometimes when landings go up, it doesn't necessarily mean that fishing mortality went down. And so to kind of buy in on that, the way you harvest most of those fish is by runaround. So, so you're taking those fish just really rapidly, but most of them are alive. Very, very few of those things are a lot smaller percentage are taken by just anchor fuel nets now because there's so that's been restricted in so much by the, the distance when you can fish, how the length, the amount of webbing you can fish. So when you go back and look at it, and you got to look at what was happening 20 years ago, you were fishing completely different than you're fishing today. So it's about 50 50 right now. But it was probably a lot. More. Yeah, no, it absolutely was. You're absolutely so. Correct. So that's reduced your disc yep. mortality even that much more. That's right. But that's right. I ain't on money for saying with this turtle. Yep. Just the, the, your fishing tackle. Yes. Yeah, time for a technical question. Yeah. So I just quick question. So, you know, speckled sea trout are interesting because they don't live very long, right? And we talk about we have a really high biomass, but I think we can attribute a lot of that to. A, a lot of the fact we've had several really warm winters in a row. So what's the benefit to managing by stock assessment versus just managing by indices of abundance or something to that nature, right? Because these fish are about as close to an annual crop as you're going to get from some of our finfish species. I know that's not the right term, but I'm just curious why, what the good benefit here is of assessing the stock versus like trying to manage from, and I'm also asking that because Dr. Buckle's sitting right next to me. <laughs> that's fair. <laughs> they use a uh, shrimp model which was a one-year model for the stock assessment so it was adapted from that yeah yeah so it was um, one year the idea was to be able to incorporate what we heard coming out of the last stock assessment uh was that it was not incorporating uh the natural mortality from cold stungs right um and we heard that it's, it's very rare that we hear something from literally every single section of people uh we heard that from the peer review team we worried about that internally, and we heard that from the public and the MFC. <laughs> so everybody uh, was saying, you know, our next stock assessment really has to be something that can incorporate uh, that cold, that increased mortality from cold stocks. Um, so that's kind of the reason we went with that uh, length-based um, mortality. That was more uh, assessment that was based off of uh, yeah, a shrimp, the, the shrimp assessment. Um, and we we found it worked because it did. Yeah, we you know we picked up the signature mm -hmm. from those cold stun years. Um, but it wasn't just that. Yeah, it's not assuming that they're annual. It's, yeah, it, it's it, allowed. It was exactly. yeah, it right. So lengths are it's easier to trip. The, the length of a tag fish, you don't know the age, so it's that's going to be nicer in the future when model that length based model is paired more closely with the tag data. But it's going to have seven year old trout, and that it's going to, you know, those are going to be a 
a mode, a length mode out there that are, you know, that length mode represents seven year old child. So fix that. Mm -hmm. So different cohorts of. So not, a, sweet. not an annual. Seven, eight, no, nine, nine years old. Seven, seven, nine years. Nine years. Yeah. And I think when we see they can live nine years. But we, but yeah. we do see we do see eight nine year old fish, but but when we have cold stuns, it seems to kill across the gamut as far as age structure goes. So it it suppresses the population, but I don't know necessarily kills big fish more than little fish. I think it kind of I think Tim's data kind of showed that it just kills across those ages. So it doesn't necessarily destroy your age structure. It just destroys your biomass. <laughs> Great recruitment. And then, yeah, we see a big bounce back. Which, because my question is like, you know, we, we kind of see this. I think the best thing we ever did was do the 14 inch size limit, right? It seems to rebound. Mm -hmm. first, first, at least this, that mm -hmm. goes back to my question. If, if we're continually being hit down by these natural cold events, what's the benefit to having a stock assessment as opposed to just managing by ind indices of abundance? It's a good question. Very good question. Um, I think uh, you, you know, with a stock assessment, you are you're seeing more information. You're able to get a a, a you know potentially a broader picture. Um, and I would think a lot of that, uh, you know, in my mind at least, uh, would would be a large part of the reason. Um, I do know, uh, you know, South Carolina manages exactly the way uh, you're you're. I'm not suggesting I'm stashing that for a yeah. question. It's, it's... Um, but I do know their managers. Uh, you know, if you talk to them, they'll maybe off the record. Tell oh, you, you that they would love a stock assessment. Love a stock assessment. <laughs> you, uh, if I can remember correctly, and it's it's been a while, I looked at those data, but um, before they closed the fishery down because at, for, because of st cold stuns, if you look at the of the records prior to that time, you'll see a cold stun event. And it seems like they came back just as well prior to when we had restrictions on them. You might want to look at that, the older data. The prior to the cold stun, looking at, I can't remember whether it was recruitment or whether it was stock size or what, but the same result happened the following year it didn't seem like cold stun, the regulations had anything to do with them coming back. You might want to look at those data. It would be in the older stock assessment. And I have it at home and I'll be glad to share it with you. Can't find uh, it's, it's, it. I've got it, no worries. I do appreciate that though. Um, Is that something that you've seen or observed while you were- Like the, mo the most recent one before this one? I, it might have been, yes, it might have been. It just, it was, I had looked at it. I looked at when they put regulations in yeah. and and close the fishery down. And then I looked previous to that when there were no regulations, when we had cold stunts, the years we had them. Yeah. And it didn't seem like there was any difference in the following year or years be, between the two events between regulations and non-regulations. Alan, do you mean uh, when they started to implement the cold stun, the closures after a cold stun? Yes. yes. And you're talking in the in the previous stock assessment? I It might have been. Now, I'm going back a ways here now. So because it might have been the previous. So prior to the management where we closed the season after um, a, a cold stun event, uh, you were saying that the recovery seemed to be about the same following those cold sun events um, compared to after we implemented the- Yes, I, I think it'd be worthwhile to look at that yeah. and see if I'm correct on, you know, in, in analyzing that. Yeah, I can definitely take a look at that. Um, my only concern would be in that previous stock assessment, one of the complaints about it was that it wasn't picking up that cold sun signature. So I would worry that it's not showing up in that necessarily. But yeah, absolutely, I can. I think that you can look at biomass from the current assessment. Yeah. And yeah. look at cold stun years. Yeah. Gotcha. Oh, okay. I gotcha. It might have been recruitment yeah. or I no, recruitment. Recruitment. Yeah. Exactly. And I, I think a lot of times you see some sort of little bit of compensatory recruitment after yeah. you see a hard kill like that. So that's a pretty common phenomenon. Lucas, there's a, a 
lot of these um, management strategy evaluations that are being done where you've got these, you have this whole list of all these management strategies that you can test that through modeling instead of the old school iterative process where managers yep. put in place, well, it didn't work after three years, let's try the other one. So one of the ways they do this management to determine what management strategy strategies to evaluate in the modeling is to go out like you do and scope the public um see what see what um you know 50 percent want you know to be able to catch big fish or 50 percent you know the other 50 percent want to catch a lot of fish and so i guess to brent's point and the other comment about trying to change how we're doing things do you do you did you get a sense that there's um, the large majority of spotted sea trout um, uh, folks that target that species are they would be happy with Brent's suggestion where they are allowed to keep the first two or four fish and then they have to stop. If, in other words, they can't catch and release or with the bulk of folks saying, I just like to go out and spend several hours catch and release fishing because that's different, right? It's different. The stakeholders want something different. It's, if the bulk of them want to be able to go and catch lots of fish for fun yeah. and catch and release, then that that's not gonna right. That's not gonna be for it's you know that's you're gonna have that waste. It's but, not what I want. I just think I'm trying to get the bite because I'm right. Well, right. 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 And then if if that's if ninety percent want that, then you're like, well, get to get that, then we have to reduce number of boats on the water. Then it's an effort reduction. That you, right, and it's just you can't you can't get there. That that's not or, or you, you say if you want to fish for spotted sea trout, then you got to have the spotted sea trout license and <laughs> give out, or you get yeah. five hundred thousand back to these <laughs> which is illegal in North Carolina. We can't do that, correct? So, okay. <laughs> well, I mean, these are all so right. really easy to try and figure out something that maybe are some permanent hunts. <laughs> permanent hunts. I just just trying to think. That's, that's what we're all for Slocum Creek, six million issue, October 14th and 15th. You know. What Brent wants them to be able to go every day, seven days a week. <laughs> <laughs> Sunset, catch all they can catch. That's what Brent wants, but that's not what the biomass says. That right. That's what I want too, Brent. That's right. what I want. <laughs> and Tom wouldn't be mad for me all the time. Who said I was? <laughs> so, yeah, I was just curious. Did you get a sense of. Uh, uh, I would stop if I called my So I do think, um, uh, thanks to uh, Commissioner Cross's ideas that came out there, a lot of folks did. Well, I'm just saying because he did bring up the, yeah. the uh, I think you were correct, Tom, and then called a catch quit in that uh, document. So a lot of people did speak exactly to that point. Um, and there is you know, now again recognizing that we're I'm only able to look at the people who participated in public scoping. <laughs> um, there is very little interest in imaginating catch and release fishing in the state of North Carolina. I would say is that a question? No, go ahead. <laughs> there does seem to be a lot of interest in more of a trophy fishery. That's been, yes, uh, what I'm sure. gathering. I would say that is true as well. There was a, a lot of interest in a uh, in a trophy slot limit. Um, in fact, there was a lot of interest in, uh, or a lot of comments to the effect of, I would like to see a slot limit, but only if it's a trophy limit. Uh, so there are a lot of folks who are not interested in a slot limit whatsoever, unless it's a trophy limit. Um, but as far as the, uh, you know, I'll catch my four and then go home, um, the comments that we heard that directly addressed that were strongly opposed. Yeah. Yeah. That would be my sense too. That's yeah. why I'm just trying to think of maybe that's not an acceptable management strategy, but then the alternative is that you have to somehow limit effort yeah. because the population, the, the number of fishers keeps going up and fish stocks not. Right now, it's what is it, 95, 90, 95% of the fish that are caught or released in the wreck? I don't know that off the top of my head. I think the MRIP number shows. So okay. it's, it's, well, it's, it's a vast majority, majority, yeah. So it's uh, authorities, there's not much wiggle room, right? It's, uh, yeah. We're losing leverage. Right. <laughs> right. 
Then remember this goose. Yeah, no, no. there's a discard. Yep. Is there a golden goose egg as far as upper slot limits for reproductive capacity? You know, like a, is a 22 inch fish, is that kind of, you know, is there a particular number, I guess, on the upper size slot fish that really has much more remarkable? There might be, but I don't know that that research has been done in the state of North Carolina. I think, uh, I think what Mr. Buckle would tell you, or probably Lee, is that fish don't spawn, spawn at certain certain points in their life. Sometimes you have wild managers say when they're younger, they're actually more productive. Uh, but then you have something to say, and, and you can kind of touch on this too, Alan, is, you know, you would think that an older fish sometimes is is more viable, but sometimes that fish that's, uh, you know, it's a producing starting at say a two year platinum period, two to four years is sometimes can produce as good as, as trying to grow them out to six or seven year age class, even though I think it varies with all fish, but, but that's what I've always kind of heard. Yeah. Right. I don't know, I mean, it's normally like a almost an exponential relationship with age or length and egg production. Um, I know there's a couple of studies with weak fish that show that that, I mean, they, they mature at like 12 inches, but some of those eggs don't have as good a viability that first year is in the second year. They kind of are a lot more, the eggs are a lot more viable and a lot more fecundity. So first year spawners may not be that productive. Second year spawners probably are really good. I'm just speculating based on what I know about weak fish. It's like a 22 inch fish. Reproducing several times a year versus they're bat they're they're once a year. they're batch spawners all of them are so they spawn over a, a season so the eggs kind of mature at different like if you look at the ovary of the fish the eggs are maturing and they release some eggs and more eggs mature and then they release some eggs and I think I don't know how many times they spawn over a season but it's usually they have a fairly protracted spawning season maybe from like June to October but I think May June June's like the peak. Yeah, they aggregate drum like a drum does, and they spawn all over the places in the marsh. No, one one of the things you were talking about, Brent and, and Jeff, you might comment on this is if you had a non fish population, it's very possible that maybe that not not the older fish, but maybe some group would within there is producing it has the highest productivity in terms of pro producing eggs because there's more of them sure problem is is that anytime you go out and fish on any stock banging off the older fish so it's hard to say then with a fish population are the two-year-olds producing more because there are more of them than the three or the fours if you had an unfished population it may be that Yes, maybe the four and five year old fish, using a hypothetical case, are producing more eggs than the older fish mm -hmm. because there's more of them. And if you the problem is is that it's a phenomenon that once you fish something, fish the older fish those fish down. It's just a phenomenon that happens. I mean if you had good fecundity data and based on length, say, I mean you could model egg production and impacts of fish mortality and size limits and stuff on the egg production. But I think we have size at maturity and I, I don't think we have to do that. Yeah, we definitely did not have the... um, so it's it's possible. I, I, Hayden does fecundity egg production, I think. A lot of the snapper groupers are doing uh, instead of spawning stock biomass to do it's in it's egg. It's almost kind of like a almost like you like sort of like a yield per recruit or something. You could do eggs per the eggs are the per female or whatever. Yeah. Biomass. Yeah. Because of the reasons that folks have been talking about, that you can have. So on a, for small fish, one pound of small fish, one pound of small female fish produces less eggs per pound than one pound of big fish. So that because that their fecundity keeps going up as they get bigger. So um, instead of just using spawning stock biomass, you could have thousand pounds of small female versus a thousand pounds of big females and the amount of eggs you get it differs and so it's but you just use spawning stock biomass you'd say it's a thousand pounds which so they they've moved to using eggs as the, the, the index of how much spawner potential out there for that so that's a good question and then the other thing that's been brought up is that 
there also is evidence that the bigger fish put more energy into each egg or it's a bigger egg. So then you get, mm. you, you can, for some species, it's been shown that there's the survival of larvae that come out of the eggs from a big fish is higher than um, a small fish. But that's that's for some species. And But often it's just the sheer numbers of smaller females, even though they produce less eggs per pound, there's just so many of them that they, that's where you see the peak in eggs. Um, when you get to the bigger fish, yeah, they're producing more eggs per pound, but there's less of them because of mortality. It's, it's difficult, like on a, a batch spawning fish, to, cause, like, to get gravid eggs and these studies are not easy to no. to get and to get good data. So a lot of fish don't have that level of yeah. information. Yeah. But. You can get the bat, how many are in the batch, but then you have how many batches, right? Yeah. Did they spawn every two days or every three days? You know they spawn them from May to October, but yeah, it's, that's a much harder thing for those. Question. On a little bit different direction. Uh, most everything that's been kicked around other than environmental factors uh, it comes down to management of rules and regulations. And I have had a lot of feedback and it was at some of the scoping meetings and well at how poor enforcement seems to be in coastal North Carolina. It, and I've had some discussion with with some unnamed people in the uh, DMF staff that feels that that's somewhat of a problem. And if there isn't any enforcement of the rules, I shouldn't say any enforcement, but limited enforcement of the rules, how good are those rules? And is this committee in a position to have any influence to step up a weakness in enforcement through the commission. So that's going to be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yes, we need your more on. officers. Um, <laughs> All right. Uh, we have. I will say our Marine Patrol officers. So we have fifty-six officers. Um, if you imagine from the Virginia border to the South Carolina. I, I understand there's not enough. Incredible, yes. But how do you fix a problem? So how do you fix it? Call your legislator, let them know that that is an important issue and that you wanna see your tax dollars used for that. And that is how you, an individual, can make a difference. That will make an enormous difference and that it's not me just giving lip service to be a good citizen. That is truly a way to support us in that way. As a committee, you could certainly, um, if you wanted to make a statement about it, you could make a statement about it and make it an issue that you bring to the commission. Um, you know, just to say, we recognize, um, you know, it, we, you can form it however you'd like, but basically recognizing that you feel that um, prioritizing support for um, additional officers or something like that is important. And so it would just be a statement um, that you could bring to the commission. Is there any well, does anybody else have any thoughts along those lines? I was going to say, is there any reciprocity with like wildlife enforcers? I don't know. I see them there all the time. I mean, is there enforcement reciprocity with them to enforce the same rules and marine fisheries officers? So, no. Um, yes and no. Actually, do you want to, do you have anything to say about this? We, so we have different jurisdictions. So um, we do work with wildlife officers and marine control officers do, um, and certainly in joint waters, we have a lot of interaction in joint waters, um, but we are under different jurisdictions. So it's not, uh, it's not like they can come in and enforce our rules and we can go in and enforce theirs, for example. That's, that's pretty much it. Um, reciprocity. Joint waters is typically the only areas of coastal North Carolina where a wildlife enforcement officer might handle more marine fishery issue, but even then it's still maybe like very much greater than it is just a practice longer. Yeah. I mean, would you guys as enforcement personnel welcome that? You know, having more help from those guys? 
Um, we try to work closely with yeah. them. Um, certain times of the year, they're busy with their stuff, more busy with ours, but we do have working relationships with gotcha. them. Yes, sir. Yeah. I think what you'll find if you ask them. You don't want to be spotlighting deer, you know. <laughs> no, what you find, what, what I'll, you'll I'll find is stuff like that. That's a lot of like the stuff. same thing. They're limited in resources, just like most state agencies. And what I was going to add to you, that Laura didn't say, not solely Marine Patrol you should advocate for, you should advocate for the division staff because you're losing all your biologists, you're losing all your stock assessment people because the federal government, time to get two or three years in here and get their feet wet and really know what they're doing, they're pulling them away from them and you're losing all your talent. I agree. <laughs> you don't want to lose your talent. So I think you don't just advocate for the Marine Patrol, they need it too. So on the commercial side, we advocate for budget. We advocate for Marine Patrol budget and for the- uh, So is there anything is that, is this so committee part. can be done more than yeah, what we're doing here now. Point. They're hearing what you're saying. They, they can care it forward for you. Yeah. I'm, 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 Laura knows I'm advocating for that. I call my legislators. I'm like, pay hey, your stock assessment scientists what they actually deserve in particular because their salaries are like half the federal system. So this, yeah. this conversation will be captured in the notes that will go to the commission and you have three commissioners um, here tonight that are serving on this committee. But if, if you all wanted to come up with a statement like Laura said, to, to go to the commission, that's your prerogative to as an advisory committee to do that. Um, so. I think you can carry it that way, but I think as Laura mentioned, it does a lot more if you reach out to your representative yourself. Here's a lot more weight. That is, that is the most powerful thing you can do. Question, what, how many marine fisheries officers did we have at, at the highest point? And how long ago was that? Um, I don't know that we've... I don't um, know that we've so I've been with Marine Patrol since 2011, and we have never been fully staffed since I've been here. But I think 56 is the max. 56 is, if we were fully staffed, it would be 56. Yeah. It might have been higher than that. Uh, you'd have to call Dean to ask him to, he could yeah. tell you. Yeah, <laughs> and it, it could be so. Um, I think at one time it was probably higher than that. I probably, about, six, my guess would be about 65. Yeah, okay, maybe higher. Um, but yeah. That would be enormous. How many do you think you need to do it? Um, 56. No, less than that. No, less than 56. It's nice to be staff in the field and be able to have a good understanding and see how that goes. Um, it would be nice to have more. Um, but just like with anything, um, you have to be realistic about what you're able to work with. So as far as a, a certain number, I, I really couldn't tell you off the top of my head. So what he's not telling you is that it's no different than the stock assessment people. Their salaries are limited and they should be a little bit stronger for the job that they do. Same way. If you want to keep the talent there, you got to pay them. That's any state agency versus the federal government. I do want to, since we're talking about Marine Patrol, put in for, are you on the Swiftwater Rescue Team? Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Okay, Swiftwater Rescue Team is awesome. They uh, have, so Marine Patrol, uh, during hurricanes, they will go out and rescue people. So they are now um, certified as a, we have a type two, I believe, cert, mm -hmm. uh, Swiftwater Rescue Team, um, and basically they go through specialized training to be able to, um, they now uh, can be deployed all over the state to um, serve as rescue. And it is um, a remarkable team and it is a huge undertaking. And they have done that, you know, through um, just wanting to get that training that was uh, completely them wanting to get that training and be able to do that as part of their job and it is fantastic <laughs> so um carter witten did um, a presentation colonel witten excuse me at one of the i think it was a february meeting anyway it's online and i can send it to you but um, it is fascinating and it is really impressive and so they've built relationships with law enforcement agencies all over the state um, and they get to work with the National Guard and the uh, State Highway Patrol to do, I think it's NC Heart, 
Mm -hmm. um, yes, is, it the, uh, is it the group? Um, um, that's basically, they get pretty... together and do these trainings. Um, they get to jump out of helicopters. Yeah. I don't I, know how you I'm not jumping out of helicopters. me up. <laughs> anyway, but the point is, when disasters happen, they then are more able and capable to go out and rescue people. And um, so they're fantastic officers and they deserve our support. Um, that's my, that's my ploy. So, <laughs> uh, not my ploy, but that's my speech. My ploy, thank you. It's late. Woo. Okay. That's it. Where's Carter carrying you for lunch tomorrow? He's <laughs> I know he's carrying you somewhere. It's a big deal. <laughs> okay. Do we need to uh, choose the peers? And I do just want to note we, we did not have any public sign up for comment. Just to make a note on the record. <laughs> So, do I move to adjourn? Right, before, you do, before you do, I'd like to say one thing. No, no matter, we're all here from different sectors of, of the field, but no matter what anybody, fisheries in this state are very vibrant for the amount of commercial harvest they have and recreational harvest they have com compared to any state there is. And the, and the data that comes out of this state is head and shoulders of any other state in the nation, in my opinion, from what I've seen on the federal level and where other states look to us. For stuff. So there's a lot of times we we butt heads on certain issues, but you all should be proud of being part of um, what I think is the best fisheries management in the United States at the state level. Thank you. That's why I stayed. That's why I stayed. <laughs> Let me interject that for you, Jern. <laughs> With that, we are. Thank you. Thank you.